We know the creation of our universe and life itself is a mystery. It's wonderful, but it's still a mystery. To explain it, we have two choices. How did it can come to be? One is random chance and natural selection, and the other is an intentional creator oversaw the entirety of both the creation and life itself. The question becomes, what does modern science actually explain, and what can modern science not explain? So what we're going to be looking for are finding the fingerprints of God, our Creator, in the origin of the universe and of life itself. Today we're going to analyze seven essential creation events, absolutely essential events that had to happen to have life and to have our Earth. In order to decide whether it's more probable that these occurred by random chance and natural selection, or were they more likely to have been created by our Creator, or what we call our God Creator. If the latter, then we need to recognize God's fingerprints within the world around us right now. It turns out that the basic tenet of our Christian kerygma, the basic elements of Christianity, states in the Bible, in the beginning God said, let there be light. Then, to paraphrase, God created our universe, our world, which is earth, and all the plants and all the creatures. It all came into being, and it was good because it was created out of love. Now, if we're going to find God's fingerprints, we're going to have to know where to look. And we do that at the junction where science knows about things and the Creator's role. Now, the Creator's role is to form our physical space. He has to start our time. He has to create all the laws of nature in order to, for life to exist. So God exists outside our physical world. We live in a physical world. God lives in a spiritual world. God is what we call transcendent. Now, he has these ideas. He makes the creation, and he begins right at this point. This point we call God's creative events. And this is where the reality, the things that exist in our world, first come into existence. So after they come into existence, science can study them, see how they work and how we understand them and how we all can understand our world because the, the science deals with our physical world and what we're going to look at is God's creative events right at this point. This is where we're going to find the fingerprints of God. This is where they're revealed. Now what are we going to look for? Well we're going to look at the major creative events. The first one is the Big Bang. That's where everything comes from nothing. Can you say Big Bang? Number two is supernova's elementary stardust. Can you say supernova stardust? Then we go to the nifty nebula. This is where we're going to create our planets. Can you say nifty nebula? How about dynamic DNA? This is what runs, this is the instruction manual for all of life. And then you have the jolly green chloroplasts. We'll talk about this. Can you say chloroplast? Kind of a funny word, but this is what makes all the oxygen. We don't have oxygen in the world. We don't exist. Then the mito mitochondria, can you say mitochondria? Mitochondria is our energy system. It's like having a battery in your cell phone. And then ultimately we get to the spark of life, which you certainly would know about. Now within these major creative events, we're going to have a bunch of mystery alerts. These little mystery alerts are things that are almost miracles in themselves. And we'll, dusk, we'll see these titles as we go along. So these are the big deals. These are the seven major creative events, and then there's going to be a bunch of little mysteries. We'll look forward to seeing them all. Now, the very first step is called the Big Bang, and this is when the universe started. We're going to go into the details of this, but this is when everything was created. So everything came out of nothing. Preceding the Big Bang was nothing. We'll talk about that. That happened a long time ago, 13.8 billion years, but it did have a birthday party. There was a beginning of the Earth, and it's roughly at this time. We know that because it leaves a whole lot of radiation left behind. This is what it looks like. And this can only be there if the universe had a beginning, and then we're going to talk about that. Let's say I have another question. Was the Big Bang really loud? It sounds like it, Big Bang. And the next question, weren't we told that the universe, our world, has existed forever? Well, the answer is, no, the Big Bang was silent. What happened was there, there was a tremendous explosion of just energy, and most of that energy was light. The Bible says, let there be light, and that's exactly what happened. 
This is called electromagnetic energy, and we'll talk about that in a minute. It's a big word, but it's really not very complex at all, and you're going to know all about it when I show you that slide. But what this did, all this energy left remnants behind, which they've discovered in the last few years. And because they can see this remnant that is called cosmic, like in the cosmic space, microwave, just like your microwave at, at your house, background, and it's still there floating around in our universe. All parts of our universe have this. And there's no other evidence of any other microwave from any other universe. So we are a single universe of definite age, 13.8 billion years, and there appears to be no other evidence of any other. We're not a bubble off some other remote universe. And when it starts, the very first thing, that first little explosion is called singularity. It's the single point of origin. So we know the world has not existed forever. It's 13.8 billion years old. Now here's another mystery within the Big Bang. So after the Big Bang started, we showed all the electromagnetic energy coming out. But it starts as a little dot, a little spot. And that's called singularity because it's a single point. But very rapidly, just like a balloon, this blows up to make our entire universe. And our universe is still getting bigger and bigger and bigger all the time. It's been getting bigger for 13.8 billion years. And it's really huge now, but that the universe has a border at some point. It's just hard to ever get there. To get the, it's going out so fast, it's hard to get there at the end. But they know it's expanding. And the scientists know because it's expanding that it mathematically has to have a beginning. So the universe is not an infant time. It's not been here forever. So, now within that are all these other little the, the matter. These would be all the stars that are collected inside the space. So you have to understand that the space was created and then the stuff within the space was created. Both of them are absolute miracles. You mentioned the word electromagnetic radiation. I don't know what you're talking about. Ah, but that's not true. Because electromagnetic energy, we said, is where the Big Bang happened, the first Big Bang happened. And it's one of the physical forces of our universe. They're also related to, another one is gravity, gravitational force, and those forces that hold all the atoms together. So everything is glued together by this, this force. That's a nuclear force. But what's electromagnetic energy? That's the question. Well, how many people have a cell phone? Well, those radio waves go bouncing off your satellite and come back to you when you turn it on and, and make a phone call. You go outside and you see light or in the, when you turn on a lamp. That's the light rays. You go have your lunch and you turn on a microwave. You go get, you hurt your hand, you go get an x-ray from the doctor. All of these are evidence. This is all electromagnetic radiation. They just go at different speed, and some have higher energy, and some have lower energy. But they're all made up of these waves, which is really amazing. Electromagnetic energy, it, it has all this energy, can do all these things, and yet it, does, it weighs nothing. There's, no, there's nothing to it. It's just a wave, and it can go right through walls. It can do all sorts of things. So it's truly a miracle. It's a mystery alert if there ever was one. Now here's another mystery of creation. Remember we talked about electromagnetic radiation in the Big Bang. It came shooting out. But there was no substance to it. There was no stuff. But lo and behold, here's another mystery alert. These high energy waves, just light waves, they crash together. So they don't weigh anything. But when they crash together, they make a lot of energy and they're able to create these little particles. Particles have names, funny names, like neutrons, protons, electrons. And they all, because of those nuclear forces we talked about, come together very quickly. So when you have just one, one, and one, you end up with the three of them coming together, making a little atom. When there's just two of them, it makes hydrogen, but they don't like to live alone. And pretty soon they add some other parts to make helium. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But what holds these, these, these are nuclear forces that hold these particles. You can see they're attractive. Here's a positive force and a negative, just like a battery. 
and they are a magnet. You like you know about magnets? You bring one next to each other, it has a positive and negative end. Poof, they just come right together. So these are the same forces, nuclear forces, and they hold everything together. Very important, but certainly is a creation event that just can't be explained. Now we know the primary physical forces. We've already talked about the electromagnetic energy and the strong and weak nuclear forces that hold atoms together. And these are virtual miracles in themselves. And now we're going to talk about gravitation. What we know is science knows all about how these forces work, all three of them, but they don't know wh why they work the way they do. Uh, we don't know what gravitation is. We know it exists, but we don't know where it, how it works, why it works, and we don't know where it comes from. But these appear to be creation events. So you know, you know their logical explanation. Now gravity is what holds us on the ground. If you fall off a bicycle, you're going to end up on the concrete. If you, you also have to know that gravity pulls the stardust together to make all the stars and all the galaxies. They're all held in place by gravity. Gravity pulls all those elements together and makes a substance. Some of it's gas and some of it's solid. But gravity also holds us in the right relation to the sun and the moon in the right relationship to our earth. That's all by gravity. We have to know that all these physical forces, all three of them, they came into being for the very first time at the Big Bang and just the Big Bang goes and then bang, there are all the forces. The three forces are in operation so are all the physical constants and all the chemical constants. And all of that happens at the first in the Big Bang because now you have time. And notice all of these require time. It's how fast it goes per second, how strong it is between atoms, how strong the gravitational force is. Is it a real strong force or a weak force? But all that came into being at the first time. So that's a clear creative event. Now, as I mentioned before, the laws and the constants of physics all have to be, exist at the very beginning of time. And you look at these, all these different kinds of principles. There's a ton of them. And you look at the, the constants, like the speed of light. You've heard of the speed of light, but it's a huge number. And all these others are constants that have to exist exactly at these levels for the Earth and the universe to even ever come to be. So what we can say is... It seems unreasonable to assume that they just randomly appeared. How could this just, at this huge, huge numbers, and they're actually very, very small numbers in most cases, how can they just appear? That's an impossibility. So it's unreasonable to assume they just randomly appeared. The only reasonable conclusion is that they were created, which is only possible if there is a creator with infinite wisdom. Now what happens next, you might ask? We know we start with singularity. It's a small spot. It created both space and material. And these are like the electrons, protons, and neutrons, and they, they combined to make hydrogen, but hydrogen is not happy by itself. So a couple of hydrogens got together, mixed in a few neutrons, and it made helium. Now when it does that, it, it creates energy, and the energy comes out as heat and light. And all of this begins to expand very quickly, and as it does, you hit the space. So this is our universe, which is a physical space. It started little, it got big in a hurry. Now the hydrogens and the heliums, in the turn, went out and gravity pulled them together and they made the first generation of these giant stars. And when we look up in the sky at night, most of what we see are giant stars. And of course they go ahead and make galaxies. You've heard of galaxies. And ours is the Milky Way. It looks just like this. Now this little friend said, hey, is there any evidence of the original energy left around from the Big Bang? To help us know that the Earth had a beginning, my nose detects something called cosmic microwave background radiation. Now remember microwaves, that's the electromagnetic radiation that we can cook with, but it existed from the very beginning. And this is what the scientists discovered. When they looked out there, there's all this radiation filling the entire universe, not any one spot. It's a little bit different in density, but it pretty much fills everything. And they know that. This cosmic microwave background radiation, this stuff, came, it's left over from the Big Bang, 
and using this data they are able to prove that the age is roughly 13.8 billion years ago. Now in addition scientists have proved mathematically not just looking at the cosmic microwave radiation mathematically that any expand any expanding universe like ours must have a beginning so mathematically an expanding physical space must have a beginning and that's important because it proves our universe has not existed for a infinite amount of time and infinite means forever so our universe hasn't lived there forever we had a beginning you might ask how do the scientists know how far the distant stars are and how do they know how far away singularity was well we'll use an analogy called with a siren so if you're standing on a corner and minding your own business but just standing there and you start to hear a siren far far away so it starts out now from that you can determine it was like four or five blocks to begin with and it went four and five blocks beyond you so if we're standing on earth we do the same thing the, the scientists use the same thing but they can't use sound but they use light and the further away it gets, the redder the color of this little planet, they turn red on you. And that's because they've gotten far enough away. It's like the siren going away. It turns red. So from us at Earth, which is like standing on the corner, we can just reverse that and look how far back the universe had to be from the beginning to, because we know what the cosmic microwave background is. We know what the sound is, basically. The color shifted from the cosmic microwave background and you just reverse it. You can look back a few blocks, and in this case millions and billions of years, to determine how far back singularity is. And that's how they figured out the age of the universe. Now we're moving on to the supernova's elementary stardust. So that's the title. We're going to have to know supernova and stardust. Now the second creation event is absolutely amazing that it even exists. Almost everything we've talked about is amazing, but this is even more amazing. So these first generation stars that came out in space, we talked about in the last slide, they, they can run out of energy. And the energy comes from the hydrogen turning into helium, and that gives off tons and tons of light energy, which we so we can see the stars. But some of them, they run out of energy. And when they do, they start to collapse. And they get, the inside, this, the core of it gets tighter and tighter. And the energy gets so high, and the heat gets so high that it explodes. Bam! Some of them just go into a black hole, but the ones that ex are explode are called supernova. Now, in, because it's so hot and so intense, do you remember this had hydrogen, helium in it, and that's it. These just little, little atoms in there. And the next thing you know, this fuses them, these hydrogen together, and it makes 94 elements. That's our element table. There's lots of them. You don't have to know their names at all. But you know some of them. We know oxygen. You know gold, silver, aluminum, uranium, all kinds of stuff that gets made. Now the interesting part is that why did it do this? Because the stars don't care. They don't, they don't care about the 94 elements. But we do because without these elements, our Earth can't exist. So these, these exploding nova happen way before it's necessary to use all this stuff. And in the next slide, we're going to look at the Nifty Nebula. The Nifty Nebula, that's another creation event that's just absolutely remarkable. The, the, these, well, these star formers, these Nifty Nebula, grab the stardust that's blasted out in space, and it's going to pick up all these elements, and it's going to make second generation, a new type of star like our sun. And around the periphery of that sun, it's going to make the planets like Earth. And this is how at least our nebula, and it may be the only one, our nebula is going to get all of these elements it needs to have life on Earth in an Earth that functions. Now I just want to, you could ask this question. Hey, we're made of more stuff than just hydrogen gas. Where does everything else come from? And I just answered it a minute ago. All the elements, all these elements we need for life on Earth were made in these giant stars when they collapsed into a supernova with a big explosion. And it took all of the heat that this, this explosion created to make 94 essential elements. And they do that by taking, here's the little hydrogens, and if you have two of them, it's helium. And you mix all of these together, because in that heat it can. It takes them and jams them together, and it comes down the scale, just making 
five, six, seven, eight, nine, all the way up to 94. Now the interesting part is that the stars don't need the 94 elements. The second generation stars will use some of them up to iron, but the Earth has to have all of them. And that's not going to be necessary until the Earth is created, which is going to happen 9 billion years after the start. <laughs> that's, that's, this is huge time. So this star, the stars are making all the stuff and blasting it out as stardust. The nebula are going to grab it. We'll show you that in just a minute. And it's only for us. So it won't happen until our Earth is created at 4 billion years, and life doesn't happen before a few million years. Now, once you create elements, when the supernova makes the elements, then all those elements can come together, and that's called chemistry, and they join together to make stuff. It makes your clothing. It makes everything that you see around you. It has to be put together by chemistry. And if you look at chemistry, there's lots of laws of chemistry, and there's lots of uh, constants. These are things that have to exist. Then they have to be all these complex numbers have to be available the moment you make the elements. Now, it seems unreasonable. There's 94 elements. It seems totally unreasonable to assume that they just ran, all these numbers just randomly occurred. I mean, that's just impossible. The only reasonable conclusion is that they were created. If they were created, then there has to be a creator. So this is clear evidence, clear evidence that a, crea a creator was involved at the very start of forming elements and the very start of forming chemistry. Just like the physics was the very start of the physical laws that we discussed earlier. So now we move on to the Nifty Nebula, and this is one of my favorite uh, space warriors right here, N the Nifty Nebula. They took all this exploding stardust coming from the no supernova, and they collect it together, and they're going to swirl around like a disk, and in the center they're going to make second generation stars, just like the Sun, and from the stuff on the outside it's going to make the planets. So how did the Nifty Nebula ever figure out how to grab the stardust, make a second generation star like the Sun, and make our planet and the other planets in our little solar system? All for what reason? The reason is you and me and our Earth. Now, we're looking at the Nifty Nebula up close. You can see that it's this structure that has a central hub to it. It looks like a wheel. And inside it's going to make a second generation star, which can have some elements like up to iron, which is up to number 26, as opposed to all these big giant stars, the first generation, they only have hydrogen and helium in them. And around, so the center gets the sun, like our sun, so our nebula. If we look at our nebula, it has the sun in the middle, and then around the outside in this disk, it's going to make the planets. And it does it because it has to add the 94 essential elements. Without that, we don't run our system. We can't exist. But it does something else very remarkable. It's truly a mystery alert. It puts our Earth exactly at the right distance from the sun so that we don't get too close and burn up or get too far away and freeze. And this is called a habitable, in other words, you inhabit a zone. There's, it, it's just remarkable that <laughs> that that exists. We're in the habitable zone. Out of all the possible zones you could have, we're at the only one that actually works for life. That is truly a mystery and God's gift to us. Now, in this step, you can't, I, I look at this step and I just start to laugh. I, you couldn't make this story up, but what happened is that when we made the earth, we got our 94 elements, but we we're a little short of water and carbon. Now, water and carbon makes up 90, 95% of everything, including you and me and the plants. But along the way, just out of the blue, a meteor arrives, and the meteor is made of ice, which is going to be water and carbon, and it collides with the Earth. So it's one-third the size of the molten Earth because they're both still on fire. It just blends in. So by special delivery, <laughs> only God could make this special delivery, you have this meteor hitting our Earth at about a, mil a billion years after it started, and it brought all the water we needed and all the carbon we needed to have life, which wasn't even going to begin for another 9 billion years. It's just utterly astounding. Now, does anybody still think this is just coincidence or good luck? It, it can't be. This could only be orchestrated by an intelligent creator. What a story. Now, then the next step, we call this another miracle alert. There's just one after another, but the Earth, Earth has layers. So when you first form it, 
it has layers. And the densest stuff, because it's all molten, goes to the bottom. So in the bottom, you have a iron core. It's solid as a rock, but it's magnetizable. And when it gets magnetized by the sun, then it has the magnetic field around it, which knocks, keeps the asteroids from constantly bombarding us. Then it happens to put uranium in this deep molten zone that's still on fire. And the, because of uranium, you know, it has fission and it, it creates energy. And that's what heats the earth from the inside. And the sun heats the earth from the outside. And so between the two, you can have life. And you have this mantle, which is just stone. And the top of this mantle has got a squishy layer right here. And the squishy layer is next to the bottom of the Earth's crust. This is the this is where we live. There's the mountains, the trees, there's the rivers, and the little bitty lakes. And then we have all this rock underneath us. But it gets down to a layer of the mantle right here that slips. And so what ends up happening, those, we, these are called tectonic plates. And originally, all the mass land mass was all together. And later, it starts pulling apart. And they slide around, and that's what we get our continents today. So it takes a while, but it slides around. And it slides right at that level. Who could think this up except God? Now, if we look at any cliff, you can go any cliff on the side of a mountain, and what you're going to see is the topsoil, which is the thin top. That's all there is, is just a little bit of topsoil to grow everything. Under that is the crust. The hard crust is full of rocks. But it comes in layers. Know how it's layered. And that's when they scientists look at find fossils from the previous past animal experience and uh, plants, they can find them in these layers because they're added one on top of the other. So the oldest rock is on the bottom. And that's how we can tell how old things are looking at fossils. But the Earth's crust is about five to six miles out of the whole Earth, and that's it. Everything else is going to be in the deep part and the core and the mantle. Now, in part one, we want to just summarize all the creative events we've looked at. The Big Bang, something from nothing. Our Creator God created an expanding physical universe, a space. It's not emptiness. It has physical forces, and it was able to make first-generation stars out of gases from the protons, neutrons, and electrons, making hydrogen, hydrogen turning into helium, turning out more power, more light, and more expansion, and out it goes into the universe, creating stars. They come together. Then we realize that from these giant stars, they collapse, and they make 94 essential elements. Why, you might add? A good question, because they're not going to be used for a long time. Now, some of them will be used for second-generation stars, but all of the 94 are going to be sent just to Earth, as far as I can tell. But it blows them out of stardust. The nifty nebula collect the stardust. They make the smaller stars like the sun, and they make the planets at the same time. We showed you how that happened. And the 94 essential elements were added to our planet. Then the nifty nebula put our planet exactly at the right distance from the sun, so it neither was too close and got burned, or too far away and froze. Then of other miracles, out of the blue, an asteroid hits the Earth, bringing the necessary water and carbon so that life could be created on Earth. Finally, the Earth was formed in layers. It has a solid iron core, which can be magnetized by the sun to avoid the field, creates a barrier to meteor hits. And it contained in the depths, uranium, which is still molten today and heats the inner, of the earth, inner side of the Earth. And the sun heats the outside of the Earth, so we have a temperature that works for life. In the second part, we're going to cover development of life on Earth all the way to the present.